Here we'll learn the mononeuropathies of the lower limb. We'll start a table with the header nerve, roots, deficit, notable cause, and localizing value. Draw an anterior view of the lower lumbar vertebral column and sacrum. Specify the L5-S1 junction, a clinically important level for disc herniation. Here the vertebral column angles abruptly posteriorly. Then draw the right pelvic bone, the femur, then the inguinal ligament. Now list the following nonspecific causes of mononeuropathies in the lower extremity. Spontaneous causes include compression, nerve entrapment, trauma, and hematoma or abscess. Note that often these things are not entirely spontaneous as iatrogenic causes can certainly lead to things such as hematoma and abscess or compression or trauma. Then list the following iatrogenic causes. Surgery with direct or indirect nerve injury. Accidental neuralgia from nerve block. An accidental nerve injury from intramuscular injection. Now let's look at the specific nerves and some specific causes of lower limb mononeuropathies. First, within the iliac fossa, draw a portion of the iliacus muscle laterally and then draw so as major medially. Together they form iliate psoas. Show that the femoral nerve descends between the psoas and iliacus muscles, then underneath the inguinal ligament and down the anterior thigh to innervate the anterior compartment thigh muscles. Indicate that it's supplied by L2 to L4, and that femoral neuropathy causes hip flexion weakness from iliopsoas failure, which manifests with difficulty climbing upstairs, and also knee extension weakness from quadriceps failure, which manifests with difficulty walking downstairs, so-called buckling knee. Indicate that notable causes of femoral neuropathy are abdominal pelvic surgery, either from instrumentation or traction, and also so as muscle hematoma. Now draw the sacrospinous ligament, which connects the sacrum to the spine of the ischium. Show that the obturator nerve descends medial to the femoral nerve, anterior to the sacrospinous ligament, and exits via the obturator canal down the medial aspect of the thigh to innervate the medial compartment thigh muscles. Indicate that it's supplied by L2 to L4 and that obturator neuropathy causes hip adduction weakness, which manifests with involuntary hip abduction during walking, gait instability from adductor failure. Although obturator neuropathy itself is rare, indicate that this is a key muscle set to examine because the obturator nerve involvement helps distinguish L2 to L4 radiculopathy from femoral neuropathy. L2 to L4 radiculopathy produces obturator nerve distribution weakness, whereas femoral neuropathy does not. Next, draw the piriformis muscle, which originates along the mid-sacrum and inserts along the superior femur at the greater trochanter. Show that the sciatic nerve exits the pelvis anterior and inferior to the piriformis via the greater sciatic foramen and then descends posterior to the femur. Indicate that it's supplied by L4 to S3 and that sciatic neuropathy causes weakness of hip extension from hamstrings failure and also total lower leg weakness from perineal and tibial distribution failure. However, classically the perineal deficits are more pronounced than the tibial deficits due in part to the more superficial location of the perineal nerve fibers. One notable cause of sciatic neuropathy is piriformis syndrome wherein the piriformis muscle can compress the sciatic nerve. So next, let's address perineal and tibial neuropathies. First, let's draw their anatomy. An anterior view, draw the femur, fibula, tibia, and a consolidation of the bones of the foot. Indicate that the popliteal fossa is the depression behind the knee, and that the fibular neck is the continuation of the head of the fibula, the top of the lateral leg bone. Indicate the tarsal tunnel as the medial entry zone of the tibial nerve through the ankle into the foot. The medial malleolus, meaning the medial ankle, and the medial calcaneus, the heel, form 
the superior and inferior boundaries of the tarsal tunnel, and the flexor retinaculum forms its roof. Show that the sciatic nerve passes down the posterior thigh. Then proximal to the popliteal fossa, indicate that it unbundles into the common perineal nerve, which passes infralaterally through the popliteal fossa, wraps around the fibular neck, and then splits into the deep perineal nerve, which is supplied by L4 to S1, and which innervates the anterior leg and dorsal foot muscles to provide foot and toe dorsiflexion. So failure causes foot drop. Patients have what's called a steppage gait. The superficial perineal nerve is supplied by L5 to S1 and innervates the lateral leg muscles, so weakness causes failure of foot eversion. Indicate the important perineal nerve compression site at the fibular neck. Involvement of the short head of the biceps femoris, the hamstrings, localizes the neuropathy to proximal to the fibular head. Next show that the tibial nerve, which is supplied by L5 to S3, continues straight down the posterior leg to innervate the posterior leg and foot muscles. So weakness causes failure of foot and toe plantar flexion and foot inversion. There's inability to stand on the ball of the foot. Make note of the important distal tibial nerve compression site at the tarsal tunnel and the proximal compression site at the popliteal fossa especially from a Baker cyst, which can compress the popliteal neurovascular bundle. As such, it can cause vascular compression signs of edema and discoloration. Now indicate that the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, also referred to as the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is derived from L2 and L3, can be compressed and cause neuralgia paresthetica, sensory disturbance in the lateral thigh. It's most commonly compressed where it passes underneath the inguinal ligament, which attaches to the anterior superior iliac spine. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh is often compressed when people gain weight, such as with obesity or during pregnancy, or simply when tight waisted pants come in vogue. The key to this diagnosis is that sensory disturbance is limited to the lateral thigh only. Now show that the superior gluteal nerve exits the greater sciatic foramen superior to the piriformis muscle, whereas the inferior gluteal nerve exits the pelvis along with the sciatic nerve inferior to the piriformis muscle. Indicate that the superior gluteal nerve is supplied by L4 to S1 and innervates most notably gluteus medius, so failure causes weakness of hip abduction. Notably, this can occur from piriformis compression. Then indicate that the inferior gluteal nerve is supplied by L5 to S2 and innervates gluteus maximus, so injury causes weakness of hip extension. Notably, this can occur from gluteal muscle injection with direct inferior gluteal nerve injury. Intramuscular injection is often delivered straight to the buttock. Also indicate that the integrity of the superior and inferior gluteal nerves helps us distinguish L5-S1 radiculopathies from sciatic neuropathy or more distal perineal or tibial neuropathies. The superior and inferior gluteal nerve distributions will be affected in L5-S1 radiculopathies, whereas they won't be affected in sciatic or perineal or tibial mononeuropathies. Finally, show that the pudendal nerve exits the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen, passes posterior to the sacrospinous ligament, and then re-enters via the lesser sciatic foramen. It's primarily supplied by S4, but also receives additional contributions from S2 and S3. Pudendal neuralgia affects the external urethral and anal sphincters and external genitalia, and notably occurs from the traumatic effects of childbirth. This concludes our diagram.